All right, welcome to our first lection on lection election. Welcome to our first lecture uh, in module three on genetics. And so, um, a lot of textbooks are going to introduce the idea of chromosomal inheritance and the idea of mitosis uh, and meiosis and even Mendelian genetics before they introduce like what the DNA actually looks like, what its structure looks like. And I don't find that to be necessarily useful because. I think it's better to understand like the structure of something before you talk about all of the different functions of it. And so that's what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of talk about the structure of DNA and then all of its functions. Um, but most importantly, we're going to talk about how we came to understand um, the structure of DNA before we talk about its function. Um, and so the idea that like traits can be inherited, it's not new. Like, um, I mean, all you have to do is like consider you're like um, I don't know, a person living like several thousand years ago, you would notice family resemblance, right? That would be something that like sticks out like a sore thumb. I um, mean, you'd be like, wow, that family all has dark hair. Or that family all has light hair. Or that family all has brown eyes. That family all has blue eyes. And so you'd be able to recognize that there was um, something that was transmitted from the parent to the offspring that was, you know, that, that determined the characteristics of the offspring. Um, and so if we go back to um, one of the first publications on the inheritance of characteristics, we end up in ancient India, um, and there was this ancient medical textbook called the Charaka Samhita, which literally means the wandering physician. And so this was a book that was put together by, it was sort of um, kind of like the Bible wasn't written by one person. Um, the Bible was written by a bunch of different prophets, right? So it's the same idea that Charaka Samhita was written by a bunch of different Indian um, medical professionals that would travel the travel country and then they would write down their findings in there. Um, and so the thing that the Char Charaka Samhita took into account was things that made make sense, right? Like the father's reproductive material, okay, and certain, this, the sperm. The mother's reproductive material, the egg. So they knew there was something that the father donated. And there was something the mother donated to the thing. Um, and then they also took into account the mother's diet. And so this goes. This is interesting because this is mostly an Eastern, an Eastern idea, is that diet will affect the development of an embryo. Um, it was an Eastern idea, but it's. I mean, it's it's more recently come to light that mother's diet plays a huge role in development. Um, and so also uh, some of the things that they study in the East would be Ayurvedic medicine and Ayurvedic medicine deals a lot with diet like um, in your constitution. So if you're somebody that's usually hot tempered and kind of red in the face and just, you know, always anxious, right? You shouldn't eat spicy food. <laughs> that's that's Ayurvedic principle number one, right? If you're uh, if you're kind of an earthy person, you don't like to move a lot, you don't have a lot of energy maybe lay off like the potato chips, beans and rice, right? Because those are big earthy things, you know, try to eat more light things, more of the air element, um, you know, greens and that sort of stuff would help somebody that doesn't have a lot of energy. So anyways, that's Ayurvedic medicine, I digress. Um, but so, so they took into account the mother's diet, but then also the individual characteristics of the offspring would be determined also by their karma. So that would be, uh, I know like a lot of people don't understand karma. Karma is actually a really simple idea. Karma is just this idea that action has ripples, right? So there's like, um, so anytime that you do something, there's going to be a ripple effect that's unpredictable in many ways, right? So let's say that you get in a car accident, right? Um, and so it stops the freeway up and all those people behind you um, are now going to be late to whatever they were about to get to. And so that has a ripple effect on, you know, whatever they were going to. And then the people that are expecting them and things like that. And so it's like, one action, right? Somebody not paying attention to which lanes or something, right? Has called caused this rippling effect of act, action in the world. And that's the idea of karma. Now, um, when we're talking about car constitutional karma, we're talking about like what propels somebody to act, right? So what sort of things drive somebody to, to make action in the world? And that would be, a, a, it, that would be um, based on three elements. It would be based on what you like to do, right? So things that you find attractive, right? Like you see somebody playing baseball and you're like, oh, I want to go play that. So you like, it changes your action, right? 
um, what you're, what you dislike, right? What you would avoid. So that'd be things like, oh, those guys are playing baseball. I hate baseball. I'm going to walk around this field. So it changes how you act. And then third, there's just neutral things, right? So there's things that you're indifferent to, but they also, they also affect how you act in the world. And so that's the idea. It's, it's, it's a culmination of what people like, dislike, and things they find neutral makes up their karma. And so they, that in, in the East, right? They're saying, oh, well, it's a, it's a reincarnative process, right? So it's that those, um, somebody died with those sets of like likes, dislikes and neutral things. And then when they get born again, right? The mother's diet, the father's reproductive material, the mother's reproductive material and their previous karma comes into play and in dictating their constitution, like what characteristics they have. Um, and then, so on the other side of the world, which I, love to bring in right so we have the eastern perspective then we have the western perspective and so hippocrates the father of modern medicine in the west right the father of allopatric medicine and aristotle one of the fathers of modern uh, philosophy and they both believe that the parental attributes so like the characteristics of each parent were kind of boiled down and condensed into either the seed or the womb so the seed being man's the woman being the womb um and so you can kind of it's kind of interesting though you're right because like this is obviously way before DNA, but they recognize that through through the process of sex that there was something planted and the woman's womb is like the fertile field, right? And then that something grows. I mean, it's almost it's almost like a magical thing in a way. Um, and so that was Hippocrates, right? And Aristotle believed that there was blueprints. So he was the first one to really use the term blueprints um, that were transmitted in the seed and womb. Um, and so that was sort of the Western idea is that it, it was less about diet and less about karma or anything like that. It was more like, okay, there's some, something in the constitution of the male, something in the constitution of the female that gets boiled down or reduced into the seed and womb that then get joined together. Those with those characteristics. So they kind of had an idea of how it was working. They just had no, um, they had no like, uh, material thing that they could provide like so they didn't have dna back then they didn't know that dna had anything to do with it so there's the charaka samhita the text all right so more recently so skip forward almost two thousand years okay and um i mean people obviously had their own ideas so i'm skipping a lot of history here um but when we're getting into dna and that there's something going on there at a, a you know at a cellular level um we jump into the 1850s right so we jump into gregor mendel and Gregor Mendel was a Catholic monk, so um, it's kind of funny. There's a there's a philosopher named Frederick Nietzsche, the one who proposed God is dead, right? Um, but you have to look in context of what he was saying. What he was saying was, um, and if you go look at his reading, it, trust me, it's in it's a thick read. So if you don't like philosophy, don't read Frederick Nietzsche. But his ideas were as this: it was so the Catholic Church got a bunch of money. And with that money, they, they believed that they could spend it on equipment and tools and technology to try to discover truth. Because at the time, they believed that there was a synthesis between the truth of the material world and the truth of the spiritual world. And so the Catholic Church um, actually commissioned some of their monks to do scientific experiments. And so through the process of the scientific experiments, the Catholic monks were actually like, discovering things that were the undoing of the religious principle in our society and Nietzsche saw that and so he said wait a second like when we're starting to switch over to complete rationalism we're seeing the death of God and so that's where that statement came from but anyways Gregor Mendel was part of that process and unbeknownst to him he thought he was actually doing something in contrast to what Darwin was doing and so Darwin was working on this idea that there was a blending inheritance um, and so Darwin was like, okay, so there's some traits from the parents, some traits from the, from each parent, um, they blend down and they create this blending phenotype in the offspring, right? That, it, that there's not discrete characteristics passed on that everything's sort of a blend. Granted, I don't know. I mean, some stuff looks that way, but I don't know how he missed like certain big features being passed down from parent to offspring. Um, but anyways, okay. So that was Darwin's idea. So um mendel's idea right was that he was able to demonstrate a quantitative inheritance of traits so he was able to say like oh this plant is tall this plant is short if i breed them together all the offspring are tall but if i bring all breed all the offspring together the short phenotype shows back up in the next generation right as the recessive type and so he was starting to quantitatively show 
that that you could inherit discrete traits from parents to offspring and they would disappear periodically, right? They wouldn't look like they went away and then they would come back. And so this idea that traits can disappear, but come back was his way of countering what Darwin was saying that everything was changing gradually over time. He was saying, no, it might appear like things are changing over time, but in reality, it always reverts back to the original form. And so hence creationism, right? Um, all right. So Mendel's work, was actually published in a very obscure German um, journal on on botany, and nobody noticed it at all because you know he's a monk just typing up his reports, turning them in. So nobody nobody was really paying attention to the work that he was doing. Um, and then along comes this guy named Thomas Hunt Morgan. So this is almost fifty years later, right? Uh, T. H. Morgan, we'll call him for short. T. H. Morgan began to do experiments on fruit flies. And so he was part of the modern synthesis. That's what, when we, when we say neo-Darwinism or the modern synthesis, we're talking about Mendel's findings blending with Darwin's findings. And so even though Gregor Mendel and Darwin were like eventually synthesized together, they stood as disparate opposites. They, they did not agree with each other at the times that their, um, that their, uh, their publications came out. They did not agree with each other, but years later they were synthesized by one of these guys. So T.H. Morgan helped with the modern synthesis of Darwinism and Mendelianism. And he was able to show that, that you can take something like something material, like a chromosome, and it can be correlated with the inheritance of something physical, like, um, like short, wings and fruit flies and so he was doing like fruit fly experiments where he was labeling chromosomes radioactively labeled i don't know if it was radioactive actually but he was labeling chromosomes so he could witness the transmission of chromosomes and then he was correlating them directly with the transmittance of traits physical observable traits in the fruit flies and so it showed that there was something material in the cell that linked to something physical in the body and so he was able to track those large chromosomes and correlate their inheritance with certain traits. And so there's Mendel and there's T.H. Morgan several decades later. Notice their uh, choice of clothing has slightly changed in those 40 years. Okay, so there are some unanswered questions, right? So um, T.H. Morgan's team was able to show that chromosomes contain some sort of information on how to inherit traits. But the problem they had was that chromosomes were made of two different biomolecules. They were made of proteins and they were made of nucleic acids. And so there was a problem there because we didn't know which one actually contained the information on how to, like what codes for a trait, right? Um, so what happened was these guys named uh, Hershey and Chase, they did an experiment with uh, viruses and bacteria. So bacteriophages, Bacteriophages are um, viruses that infect and only target bacteria. And so what they did was they did these experiments in 1952. So this is almost a decade before Watson and Crick won the Nobel Peace Prize for their discovery of the structure of DNA, like the molecular structure. So these guys are still, these guys are about a decade earlier and they're showing that it was actually DNA that was the molecule of inheritance. And so they did this by um, doing a comparative investigation. They didn't have a control group, right? So this is what they did. They took one phage, right? So one of the viruses, and they radioactively labeled its proteins on the surface of its capsule. So that's like its entire body was labeled with, um, with radioactive sulfur, which was in the proteins. So the whole body was labeled, but the DNA was not labeled in this group. And so what they did was they let these ba or these bacteriophages infect the bacteria, and then the bacteria would go create new virus particles, and those new virus particles did not have the radioactive proteins. And so they said, okay, obviously the proteins are not carrying the information on the code, but they wanted to see if it was DNA. So they checked for DNA. So they radioactively labeled the phosphorus in DNA. And if you remember, phosphorus is bound to four oxygens and a phosphate, and so that phosphate phosphate group was radioactively labeled that is the backbone of DNA. And so that phosphate group, they labeled it red. And well, it's in this image, it's red, but it was radioactively labeled. And then they, the protein was just normal on the surface of it. And they let those bacteriophages in, uh, infect the bacteria. And then they found out that, yes, indeed, it was the DNA that was being inserted into the bacteria that was infecting them.
And so they figured out that the um, that it was DNA from those experiments. So radioactively labeled proteins, radioactively labeled DNA. That way they could figure out which one was the molecule of inheritance. All right. So then along came this Frederick Griffin guy. Um, so remember that uh, Hershey and Chase were doing a comparative investigation, right? There's no control group for these guys, right? They're doing an experiment for sure, but it was a comparative experiment. Now, Frederick Griffin, he actually did an experimental investigation. So what he did was, um, what his results were, was that he was able to show that there was a material that codes for um, deadly characteristics inside a cell that could be transferred from bacteria to bacteria. And so this was the idea that there was this heritability of a code. Now, if you look up here at the top, when, when I first found this picture up here, whoop, when I first found this picture of Frederick Griffin up here, I go, holy crap, that guy actually looks a lot like my grandpa. And so I put a picture of my grandpa <laughs> right next to him. And I'm like, tell me these guys don't look related. All right, look at them, their little glasses, little beady eyes. Anyway, I digress. And so, okay, so he did this heritability experiment with bacteria. And so what he did was he had a certain type of deadly bacteria that would kill an organism like a mouse. He had a type of bacteria that was totally benign, something like found in the gut of mice. And so what he did was he killed the deadly bacteria, he blended them up, and then he mixed that blended up deadly bacteria, right, which was no longer alive. He mixed that deadly bacteria in with the living bacteria, the living non-deadly or benign bacteria. And then after, you know, he shocked it and whatever, and then he injected the remaining solution into healthy mice, and all of those mice died as if they were attacked by the deadly bacteria. Even though the deadly bacteria were all dead, just just their DNA was in that solution, and the living bacteria picked it up, incorporated it into their own genome, and then they became deadly. They behaved as if they were deadly bacteria, and they killed the mice they were injected into. And so here's how he set up his experiment. So um, there's four different parts to it, right? Um, the first part was that he took the deadly bacteria, and he injected it into a living mouse, and it killed the mouse. So that was proof, right? That's sort of a control, right? A pathogenic control. That was proof to him that the deadly bacteria was actually deadly. Then he took the benign bacteria and he injected those into a mouse just to show that they were not deadly. Okay. Then he heat killed the deadly bacteria. So this would be a non-pathogenic control. So he heat kills the deadly bacteria and injects them into a mouse and it doesn't die. So it's just showing that when the deadly bacteria are dead, they can't kill a mouse. And then here's the genius part. This is the best part. So he killed the deadly bacteria, heat treated them, blended them up, mixed them in with the non-deadly, and then injected that solution into the mouse and the mouse died as if it was killed by the deadly bacteria. And so that showed that there was some material of transmittance that made the bacteria deadly that could be incorporated into other bacteria. So that was kind of a cool, um, a cool experiment. So anyways, um, let's talk about Rosalind Franklin for a little bit. So Rosalind Franklin was, uh, there There was a whole bunch of studies that I'm leaving out of this. Um, if you ever take genetics, I'm sure you'll go into all of them in, in excruciating detail. Um, so there was people that figured out that there was adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. There was an experiment that figured out that adenine and thymine were present in the same quantities as cytosine and guanine. And so if there was 100 adenine nucleotides, there'd be 100 thymine nucleotides. If there was 200 cytosine nucleotides, there'd be 200 um, guanine nucleotides. And so they found that there was this proportional relationship between the two nucleotides. And that's because of complementary base pairing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so they were able to figure out there was complementary base pairing, and they figured out it was... Um, uh, a bunch of other stuff. So anyways, Rosalind Franklin was helpful because what she did was she used x-ray crystallography. She basically shot some high frequency photons at the DNA molecule itself and then witnessed the pattern that it formed on, uh, on the screen. And so what you're seeing here is basically the double helix nature of DNA. So this is just one of where the crossing patterns are like cross in the DNA strand. She's not looking down at it. She's looking at it from the side. And so what this is showing is that some of the some of the x-rays are bouncing off the nucleotides. Um, it's showing that there that there's a three-dimensional structure, like a, a helical structure to it. Um, and so she was able um, to show that it was a double helix. Watson and Crick took her information and they said they are, they were already playing around with 
having the bases facing outwards. They were playing around with the bases facing inwards, but they were able to take her information and say, ah, it's double stranded. It's helical. So it spirals and it has the bases facing inward. And so here's an example of how it's sort of like a physics example of how she was able to determine the, that it was a helical structure is if you look right, if you notice there's a spring here, which is a helical structure and you shine light through it, right? It creates this pattern, this X like pattern on a two dimensional background. And so that's what she was doing with the crystallography. Um, Watson and Crick, these two guys, right? Super smart, right? Molecular biologists, they were able to determine this, the overall structure. And so they get, they get all of the credit, basically. They published their findings in Nature. They won the Nobel Prize in 1962. They did, they're credited with the discovery of DNA. Here's an excerpt from their, um, from their original publication. And they're wishing to suggest a structure for the salts of deoxyribose nucleic acid, or DNA. Has a lot of novel features, which are of considerable biological interest. Um, and so this is a picture from their um, this is a picture from their publication, and it looks just like the DNA that you see in your textbook now. Um, and so here's all the white guys that won the Nobel Peace Prize back then, because that's how things went back in the 60s. Okay. Anywho, uh, so let's look at now. Now let's look. So they, they figured out the structure of DNA. Now let's now let's look. Let's us look at the actual structure of DNA. Okay. So DNA is a double-stranded polymer made up of monomer nucleotides, okay? And each monomer is made up of a phosphate backbone, a deoxyribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Okay. Or, right, if it's an RNA monomer, it would be made up of a phosphate backbone, a ribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So deoxyribose sugar or ribose sugar determines whether it's DNA or RNA, right? All right, so let's talk a little bit about the structure. So there you go, phosphate group. Uh, this one is deoxyribose sugar and then a nitrogenous base. Okay, so this image should look familiar. This is from our unit one where we're talking about the uh, molecular structure of nucleotides. Um, our nucleic acids. And so this is what we're looking at here, right? So there's a pento sugar, a five ring sugar. In DNA, that pento sugar is missing the oxygen or it's missing an OH group or however you want to say it. It's missing an oxygen from its two prime carbon. Okay? Um, DNA also uses thymine while RNA uses uracil. So the nucleoside thymine in DNA and then the nucleoside uracil in RNA. And so these are all nitrogenous bases. They're, they're sometimes called nucleosides, right? So notice this was confusing to me for a long time too. I didn't know there was a difference. So nucleotide has the three components. A nucleoside is just the base, just the nitrogenous base. Okay. Um, all right. So when two complementary st strands of DNA line up together, okay, uh, they're going to hydrogen bond together. Between adenine and thymine, there's going to be two hydrogen bonds. And so the reason I taught you guys electronegativity in unit one and module one is because it comes up often, right? So take a look at this, right? So these dotted lines are not an actual bond, right? That's just, that's a magnetic attraction between these two parts of each molecule. So nitrogen, if we go to our periodic table of elements, nitrogen is very electronegative. Not as bad as oxygen, but it is pretty bad. So it's going to pull the electrons from hydrogen towards it, leaving a bare proton out here in solution. And so there's a positive charge. I'm going to annotate this. So there's a positive charge here on this hydrogen, right? Because that proton's sticking out in space. And then this oxygen over on the thymine on the other strand right? Oxygen is extremely electronegative, so it's pulling the electrons towards it, so it's going to have an overall negative charge. And that's where we get this hydrogen bonding between the complementary base pairs. And then once again, you know, I'm going to show you over here. So this nitrogen is electronegative. It pulls the electrons from hydrogen, leaving positive charge here. And this nitrogen here is bonded to two carbons, and so it's pulling the electrons towards it, so it has a negative charge. And then there's the hydrogen bonding taking place. Okay, so adenine and thymine have two hydrogen bonds. Whereas let's take a look at cytosine and guanine. So same thing, oxygen's electronegative, nitrogen's electronegative. So it pulls the electrons towards it, leaving a positive hydrogen proton there. Uh, this hydrogen proton's got its electrons being stolen by that nitrogen. 
And then this nitrogen has a negative charge. This nitrogen is pulling the electrons from hydrogen, leaving a positive charge. And then this oxygen is pulling the electrons from uh, the carbon right here. And so you get these magnetic attractions between the nitrogen spaces between the nucleosides. Um, so let me finish up my annotation there. Yeah. So you got two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine and three hydrogen bonds between cytosine and guanine. And so when you get these two strands, right, these two complementary strands lining up, you get two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine while three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. All right. So this is an example of, it's a bigger, so it's like zooming out from what we just looked at, right? So this is just one base pairing, right? Now let's look at, we've got a strand of nucleotides here on this side, a strand of nucleotides over here. They're all bonded together. So it's a polymer. It's a double stranded polymer. There's two strands that are zipped together. They're zipped together by the hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases. But here's something I want to point out to you, right? These two strands, are running opposite directions to one another, right? Notice the sugar, the ribose sugar here has its oxygen on top pointed up. Notice here the sugar over here has its oxygen group pointed down. And so the two strands aren't parallel, they're anti-parallel. They're anti-parallel. So one is running up, the other one's running down. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. And so what you'll see, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different ways that we like to draw these nucleotides. So here's a textbook example of a DNA strand on the far left over here. Let me grab my pointer. So this is a textbook example of a DNA polymer. Go back here, right? And remember what I said about Watson and Crick? Look at theirs, right? So they proposed this helical structure to DNA. And then 70 years later, it's still relevant, right? It's still used in textbooks, that helical that helical look. Um, and so if you look, right, what we haven't drawn in this picture, these blue strings represent the phosphate backbone. They represent this part. See how the phosphate group is binding all the sugar molecules together to make the polymer? These phosphates are binding all the sugar molecules to make the polymer. That's what you're seeing here. These blue strands represent the phosphate backbone that's gluing all the uh, nucleotides together. So to draw the DNA molecule like this is a pain in the butt. So we draw it sometimes like this, where you can see the phosphate group binding to the sugar molecule, bonded to the phosphate, to the sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. Right. So there's a phosphate sugar backbone. But the most important part of the DNA, the part that we really care about is the order and sequence of nucleotides as it appears on the strand. And so oftentimes we'll just kind of shorthand these uh, this phosphate sugar backbone. We'll just shorthand it into two strands whomp, whomp, and only show the bases. And then sometimes when it's like when we're only showing maybe like in DNA replication or something where we don't need to show you all the nucleotides, we might just draw the two strands together like this, right? Or you may even see them so simply drawn that you draw two strands next to each other and label the ends and the directionality of the strand. So notice this five prime end of this strand, the three prime end of the same strand, and then the other strand is upside down. So the three, three prime end is up and the five prime end is down. Let me, let's real quick, just visit why there's a three prime and a five prime end. Okay, and I'm gonna go back to the image of this. Okay, so the DNA sugar, the ribose sugar, or the deoxyribose sugar has five carbons, right? It's got a one prime carbon, that's the one bonded to the nitrogenous base. Two prime is the one that's either missing or not missing the OH group. Three prime carbon is the carbon that's, is the three prime carbon is the one that's bonded to the phosphate group that's attached to the next nucleotides. You can see that here, right? This is the phosphate group that's attached to the three prime carbon of the sugar above it, right? Um, where was I? Four prime sugar, That's that one's pretty inert. It's not doing anything. The oxygen group from that four prime sugar is right here that's creating the pentagonal shape. Um, five prime though, five prime sugar is bonded to the phosphate that is attached to the nucleotide above it. So notice the orientation of this sugar molecule, kind of turn it like 45 degrees to the right. Here is your five prime, wow. Here's your five prime carbon and it's bonded to the phosphate group. So when the five prime carbon is facing up, right? We'll say that's the five prime end of that DNA strand. In the, when the three prime end is facing down, we'll say that's the three prime end. And so that's why DNA strands have a directionality, a five prime and three prime. They're talking about the orientation of the sugar molecule. All right, moving forward. Um, so DNA, when we go to like pack it away, when we go to store DNA, what we're gonna do is take these histone proteins. So 
histone proteins are positively charged proteins. Uh, they arrange themselves like once they wrap the DNA. Cause think about this, right? So DNA has a phosphate group, which is extremely electronegative, which has a lot of um, electrons around it. So DNA itself has an overall negative charge. Histone proteins have an overall positive charge. And so the histone proteins are able to wrap the DNA around themselves, right? Just like a yo-yo. So they wrap the DNA around, around themselves, and then they organize themselves into scaffolds. Okay. Well, the well the the little balls, like those are called nucleosomes, right? You can see an electron microscope image of them. They look like little balls on a string, right? Those are a nucleosome, and the nucleosomes arrange themselves into scaffolds, right? And so all of these scaffolds then of tightly packed DNA molecules those scaffolds stack on top of each other and make a chromosome. Now, in this particular image here, right, remember this DNA strand has a directionality, right? So one of these helical structures is going to have a five prime end here. The other strand is going to have its three prime end here. And there's, remember, there's a directionality to the order and sequence of nucleotides. Now, remember that in eukaryotes, this is linear, right? This chromosome is linear. So there's a start and then there's a finish to that, to that string of DNA. Whereas in prokaryotes, it's circular, right? There is no start, there is no finish. It's just a circle, circular chromosome. So anyways, um, this one string from start to finish represents one homologous chromosome. You get two homologous chromosomes, one from each parent. And so what ends up happening is that when this, when this cell goes to divide, it needs to copy both chromosomes to pass one set of each onto the next uh, cell, or it could be the next generation if we're talking about like sperm and egg. But this idea though is that you have two homologous chromosomes. They have the same exact sequence of genes on them. It's just the nucleotides are slightly different, right? And that's where we get alleles from. So anyways, two homologous chromosomes with the same order and sequence of genes on them, they get replicated, right? So now you actually have four copies of the same gene when it gets replicated. And what you're seeing in this picture here is just one of those chromosomes getting replicated. And now it looks like there's two stacked side to side and we call those sister chromatids, right? So one of them is called a chromatid and then together they're called sister chromatids and together they represent a replicated chromosome, just one of the two, right? Um, all right, so let's move on. So histones have an overall positive charge, which is great, right? Because that's a, the negatively charged DNA is attracted to it. Um, so what this does is, like, if if the cell isn't using the DNA, like if it's not actively like copying it into RNA or if it's not replicating it, it kind of like allows it to pack it up and store it out of the way, so it doesn't get in the way of other uh, chromosomes that are actually being used by that cell. Um, and also, um, it helps to keep the DNA tightly packed together during cell division. So if you're going through mitosis and you need to pull like all of this information apart from each other, if you need to separate these two sister chromatids, right? It's best if they're tightly packed up to do the move, right? You never want to move your house by just taking like your dishes and putting them in a moving truck, your silverware, dumping them in a moving truck. You know, you want to put them all in boxes. You want to keep all your stuff tightly packed. So it's easier to do the move. And that's what DNA does is it tightly packs itself up when it's going to move. Okay, um, now when the cell needs to use the DNA, right, when it wants to unpack it and actually access it, it will acetylate the histone proteins. So it'll come over and it'll put a negative charge, it'll attach a negative charge to the histone proteins, um, and then that negative charge repels the DNA, it loosens up the DNA that's wrapped around the proteins, and so you get this negative, negative re repelling, and the DNA loosens up and unwinds, and then, and then um, if you're replicating the chromosome, the replicating machine can access it. Or if you're copying it into RNA, the, the RNA transcription machine can uh, access the DNA. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the names of the states for when the DNA is in one state versus another. So when DNA is tightly packed away and it's wrapped around histone proteins, we call that heterochromatin. When DNA is loosely, like when it comes unwound and it's nice and loose, we call that euchromatin. So heterochromatin, right, is the tightly packed DNA wound around the scaffolds and histone proteins. And we can do that for two different reasons. We can do it to store away DNA that the cell actually will never need. And then we can also do it when we're moving entire sets of chromosomes during mitosis or meiosis. Now, euchromatin, when the DNA is loosely packed, right, and it's kind of like hanging out in the cell as a single strand, 
okay, that's great because it can open up the access to genes that that cell actually needs to be turned into proteins to actually do its job. Um, also, like if you need to replicate your DNA chromosome, like you have to copy your chromosome so you can make a new cell, right? That would also, the U chromatin would also open up access to the DNA. All right. And so let's talk about the, um, I, I briefly mentioned this earlier because I thought I already told you about it, but here we go. So prokaryotes have circular chromosomes. Right? And they exist in the cytoplasm because prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. They don't have a place to keep the DNA other than the cytoplasm. And then eukaryotic chromosomes, this one is in its heterochromatin state. or um, It's in its euchromatin state, sorry. Um, part of it's in heterochromatin. Some of it's tightly packed up, right? But a lot of it's loose and unwound. Um, and you'll notice that there's a definitive start, and I think this is the definitive end over here. I could be wrong, though, right, if you trace it around. Or this might be more than one chromosome. There might be a one here and an end here. But the point is that they're linear. There's a start and a finish to each chromosome, um, and they exist in the nucleus. Okay. All right. Humans, us, and a lot of animals, to be, to be honest, right, um, are diploid. And so that means we have two sets of homologous chromosomes, right? And so sometimes we'll say that means that you are 2N, right? Um, so we are diploid. We use two sets of homologous chromosomes. One set of homologous chromosomes, like the left one of each one of these, right? So this yellow side, this red, the left red chromosome here, the left blue one here, green one, right? One set of those. So that's like, imagine these kind of all look like pairs of shoes, right? So if these are all pairs of shoes, your father, your dad, right, your paternal parent <laughs> supplied all of the left foots in all of these chromosomes. He provided the left foot. And then your mom, your mother, your maternal um, person is going to provide all of the right foots. And so together, there's 23 pairs of shoes or 23 pair homologous chromosomes. And the genetic information on each homologous chromosome is identical to its counterpart, right? So the order and sequence that genes appear on these chromosomes is identical. But if the genes are slightly different, right, like the order and sequence of nucleotides in the gene is slightly different, we call those alleles. And so it's possible to have a different allele from your dad than the allele that you get from your mom, even though they are both variants of the same gene. So we talked about the two states that DNA can exist in, right? Heterochromatins is tightly packed state, and then euchromatin is sort of this loosey-goosey unwound state, right? Um, and so that's just kind of how I want to finish it up there. And I'll see you guys for the next one. Adios.